Hi, and uh, welcome to the second uh, episode of Access Chat. Today, we're really pleased to have Gareth Ford Williams uh, with us to talk about uh, the BBC's accessibility framework. Delighted to have Gareth on as our first guest, stroke victim. Uh, it's really um, something that uh, I've been talking with Gareth about for a long time. We've been chatting over tea for quite some time, um, and it's really good to get Gareth on and talk about the, the great work that the BBC does, which a lot of it's public facing, a lot of it is an exemplar for us all. Um, and Gareth's going to explain a lot about the framework behind this. Um, I'll hand over to my colleagues. Um, hi Gareth, it's uh, nice having you. Hi. hi. Hi Antonio. Hi Neil. Hi Deborah. Yes. Yeah, Gareth, welcome. We are really excited to have BBC here representing us. We, um, you're our best practice, so um, I think we all can learn a lot from today. So thank you for being our first guest. Right. Oh, um, uh, that's that's a lot to live up for. That's a heck of an introduction. So I hope I can live up yeah. to it in the next. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> and and be and be ready for the Twitter chat. Yeah. So, yeah. Please tell us how you walk on water. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes, big inflatable shoes. Uh, it, it's um, I, I I don't know if we actually do. I, I, I to be to be quite honest, I mean this is this is always a work in progress. Um, and uh, sorry, does everyone else getting an enormous amount of white noise? Mm, no, I think that might be your your high quality. Um, headphones that you're using. Right, they're, they're hang on. I, iPad headphones, are they? Uh, yes, hang on a second. Can I just be really, really rude and go and get some actual headphones that work? Real ones? There's some, yeah. there's some there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it can be very distracting having that playback. Yeah. Well, luckily, cool. there's a, a, yeah, we are continuing. a national broadcaster. They have got access to headphones. <laughs> I was in such a hurry coming upstairs, I completely forgot to grab these. So, usually, use these on the, desk, on the desktop to come up eight flights of stairs and install Skype and get back to you. You did well. <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit this bit out. Knackered. <laughs> I can't run upstairs like I used to. Right. <laughs> That's better. Oh yeah. my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 There you go. I'm not quite sure. They're kind of weird. <laughs> but yeah, they work. That's all I care about. Uh, right. I think they set off your your hair beautifully. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A lovely shiny head. Um, <laughs> So. Right. Okay. So, so if we go, if we rewind the tape again, um, and we can edit that last few seconds out, and and uh, so Gareth, would you like to um, give us a bit of a background on on how you came to um, start your work embedding accessibility on on the BBC? Well, it pretty much goes back to about 2005, um, although it was from Brook. Cast terms. I mean, accessibility has always been part of what the BBC does. I mean, it's just a fundamental thing that it's kind of core to us. You know, it's paid for by everyone. It should be accessible to everyone. And and it's one of those organisations. I, I I do feel rather privileged to work for it. That you don't actually really need to make a business case. You know, people, you usually got people at, at, at hello. Um, the, the the question that we're always asking really is how do you make this accessible? And that, and that is a very very open question. Um, particularly is, um, I mean, you never catch up with accessibility. This is one of the things because people keep innovating. You know, it's one of the things I keep saying is we're, we're going to get there. We, we, we'll get to the 100%. As soon as everyone stops coming up with ideas and inventing new things, <laughs> <laughs> make my life easy um, and, and stop that. being creative. Yeah. <laughs> but so you know, so we, we we took this kind of ethos that um, really started way back, and I suppose in the you know it goes back to the sort of 1970s when we were we, we were building our first well the world's first sort of selectable uh, subtitle system, and uh, we were doing our, our first programming as well for for deaf uh, deaf community, um, and then onto audio description and 
and, and we kind of looked at it and just gone, well, we really should be just extending this ethos into everything that we're doing digitally. And, and, and we took a business case. We did write a business case and we, we took it all the way up to, to the exec board and the exec board went, yeah, absolutely. You know, there, there is actually any discussion to be had here. But what we, we got an agreement from them was, I mean, this, this was early, but it's, it's to try and understand what, how we would build something that would, that would scale in the way that it was a lot of prediction at the time but the way that we, we could see that the services were going to grow um, you know we started our, our mobile services were just starting around about then and everyone's this mobile thing didn't know if it's going to take off um, and uh, you know and we were doing stuff on the red button services which I believe is fairly unique to the UK I'm not quite sure if we have how what how interactive TV works beyond the UK um, and so we have this huge interactive um, uh, red button service which is actually bigger than bbc.co.uk in its usage uh, I think it's something like reaches about 16.9 million people in the UK um, and, uh, and and online is about 14 15 million it's around about there um, and so you know and we've got all these services and stuff so we, we, we said right we got permission to start working on this thing that was at the time called imp uh, and there was a there was a, a first prototype being built it then became my BBC player and, and latterly, eventually uh, in 2008, launched as uh, iPlayer. Um, and and we, we just ploughed everything into that. We formed a team with, with uh, Lucy Dodd, who some of you might know as Lucy Policino, Andrew Strachan, eventually Kevin Carey, who wasn't the chairman of the RNIB, uh, was, was, was on that team as well. And we just ploughed in and, and just asked loads of questions and tested loads of stuff out and we did use you know WCAG 1 but we, we also then put trying to put WCAG in context of, of a service delivery and a big product delivery as well um, and we pretty much came to a conclusion at the time that we need to build our own standards um, we need to train people we need you know we need to you know we need to embed this in in business as usual rather than in, a, in an accessibility team and it's taken years I mean it, it has actually taken an enormous amount of time and and sometimes we've done it right and other times it's not gone so well um, but every single time we learn and I think that's part of really what everyone should should should, should do strive for is you know it, even if you you've tried and you failed you go back and ask the question is where did this go wrong and and then next time you build next time you iterate on the on the product that you're doing you you, you use those learnings and make it better and it never becomes less accessible than the previous version um and so you know it's, it's one of those you know when people talk about accessibility on 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 the iphone no no one talks about iphone one and two you know it was all built and built and built it got to iphone four and they'd done the groundwork um, and I think that's where we are now. You know, we've done so much of the groundwork. We're in a, a quite robust position, but you know, stuff is still moving, and we're still iterating, and we're still changing. Um, it, it, it's 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 a difficult thing to kind of convey without showing some horrible chart. But you know, we we've got this kind of framework where we say, right, okay, we you know. We've got the policy that sits behind it, so really, really high-level policy. We have a, a diversity strategy that the exec board of the BBC, you know, sort of uh, pushes to absolutely everything the BBC does. And one of the five objectives of that policy is to build in accessibility from the start in everything that the BBC does. That's it. Whether it's a building, that's whether it's buying software for use on the BBC desktop, that's for whether, you know, we're, we're re refitting studios or, 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 or building a, a mobile app. Um, and and so there's there's all this policy and uh, and it's great, but it's it's putting that into into action and into context um, that's where we've ended up where we've ended up. And so we we discovered a heck of a lot of things. We discovered sort of standards are a great tool, but they're not an answer. Um, we we know that you know sort of you know you can you can build stuff that standards compliant that people can't use, which we've learned the hard way on a few times. We've sat there going it ticks every single box. And yet the user experience absolutely falls apart. Um, and so we've ended up with this, this, this framework, uh, where I always like to describe it, where we've got sort of training and, it's, and so we train our developers in, in techniques and standards and guidelines and there's a differentiation between standards and guidelines. Um, we have standards, which are the things not that we try and achieve Standards are the things that are objective, totally wholly objective. You don't, you, you can, 
anyone can understand them and they're the things that we don't fall below so that's that's like the thing that's there they're your foundation underneath it you have your guidelines which are your best practices which are the things you try and achieve and you train people in and they're the things that are the things that are always going to evolve because they're far more subjective yeah. Um, and we, we use, you know, we've built a QA framework, so we've got one for, for web now, and, and currently we're building one for, for, for mobile, so the QA teams have, you know, sort of cucumber scripts and whatever, and, and you know, sort of manual and automated tests for testing loads of this stuff, can you, can and, and we have a champions network, yeah. you know, currently I think we have 41 champions, and this is growing, we've only just, this is something that's very, very recent, building a champions network, which is brilliant, and we just sort of put out, we haven't even put out a really big uh, push on this and we just kind of mentioned it in a few meetings and in, in a couple of emails and we've already got 41 people signed up to it who all want to be trained and supported and become accessibility experts you know so and and, and, and I know you've developed formalized training you've got the academy um, yeah so, uh, and, and you know that's an, a tremendous resource that you've, you've built up there um, which is something that we can all aspire to um, you know it's 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 a you know a great way of, of pushing out accessibility and devolving the responsibility for it because I think the danger we all face as, as people in in this area is that we try and boil the ocean and try and do it all ourselves. Yeah. And and, and you and I both know from from previous pain that that's not possible. You know, you, you mentioned yourself you've got millions of different viewers that so many mul multiples of platforms. It, it, it can only work when when people start doing it as, as, as business as usual. So, ha, um, how have you found the process of, of, of embedding it? I know that it's built into the, the the overall DNA of the BBC as a public service organisation. But but what what have been the the, the biggest learning points about um, bringing that into your into your processes so that it's at the front end rather than the back. So that you I, I think testing uh, yeah it fails after it <laughs> there's no point in, in well, I, I'm, I have a quite a cynical view on auditing and and I think if you if you need to run an audit it, you're already admitting that it's massively broken and probably all you'll achieve by then is if you if you try and fix it and retrofit it you'll just end up with something that's a bit less broken um, you know, you, you can't fix something at the end. There is no such thing as an accessibility sprint. Uh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as soon as you've planned one, you're already planning to break it. You know, accessibility happens in every single sprint. It happens before the first line of code is written. You know, you make sure that everyone who's going to write that code, who's going to design it, has already done the training. You know, that's where when we're, we're, we're working and we're, we're Fingers crossed, it's about to launch a, um, uh, a training module for product managers, and and so one of the things that we're t talking to product managers about is is how they they don't need to know what accessibility is technically, or from a UX point of view, or really from anything like that. But what they need to know is what activities need to happen one where one what activities need to happen where in the process. You know, so you just say right, okay, we have the shape, build, run process and so right in, the sh in, in, in that internet, uh, uh, sort of initial phase, the shaping phase, so what sort of things should they be asking, you know, should they make sure they've got a champion, should they make sure everyone's done the training, should they make sure that, that they go back and have a look at the previous version of the product and go, what did we achieve then and should, right, okay, that becomes our baseline, what didn't we, what weren't we able to deliver, do they become new requirements, you know, and get your business analysts having a look at some of this and, you know, so you're actually really planning and getting, you know, sort of right, your teeth right into it at the beginning and then you don't end up with this horrible situation at the end where there's enormous amount of friction, a hell of a lot of shouting, it's massively costly and, and, and it, you end up shipping something that's broken. Um, and 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 you're just really just waiting for the fallout, you know, when it goes live, <laughs> which you know it, it happens. We've all been there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a horrible situation, but yeah, it's one that's recognisable and one that we all want to try and avoid. Yeah. Uh, Gary, you know, uh, obviously you have been accumulating a huge uh, experience around this. Uh, how, how, how are you sharing the best practices or uh, not just sharing, uh, do you have people asking you, uh, oh, you guys are doing this, this is amazing, uh, uh, please share this with us. What type of feedback are you getting from your work? We, well, obviously, I mean, we, we spend so much time, we, we are 
it's a funny organization the BBC and we spend particularly on these kind of things a heck of a lot of time just looking inwards and and just trying to keep our own house in order and 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 in the last couple of years we've really said no this this what we're doing we need to open it up where we can and you know there are on the training side Neil's already mentioned our training and we do have a number of, of, of training courses and stuff but Unfortunately, you know, sometimes there are fair trading issues around making those available. And that is absolutely fair because the BBC should not damage other people's businesses by putting something out there that actually someone else is already providing. I think that would be wrong. And there are some great people out there that can, you, you, you can learn from. But things like, um, you know, our standards as well, but the standards are, are, are not, you know, a replacement for WCAG. Um, I, I, I'd encourage people to have a look at them, have a look at the techniques library, because the way we do standards is, is very different. I think I've already mentioned there, standards are a baseline, guidelines are something that you try and, uh, you know, sort of a bit more, so especially if you try and achieve. Um, but behind every single one of them, we have a techniques library that we're growing, we're growing which is platform specific, and we, we, we publish the tests. And and so, you know, they may be useful resources. I mean, you know, WCAG, again, is a, is a brilliant resource. And, and you may be able to build your own context. But I think that is, that is a really important thing, you know, just don't take something off the shelf. You know, take WCAG and, and put it in context of the thing that you're building and going, actually, which bits of this do I need to concentrate on? Is it A, AA, AAA, or is it a mixture of all of them? You know, is because, you know, that... To me, I, I've always struggled with the A, double A, triple A thing because I, 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 each time you build something very differently, um, different parts of it are easier or harder to deliver, and different pe parts of it are more or less meaningful. Yeah, I um, think it's dependent on context. Um, yeah. One of the things I really like about the, the, the standards and the way you present them is that they are presented in language that is not um, complex, it's unambiguous. So you've got the, the, the musts and the shoulds, uh, rather, and the, the, should, uh, the should nots and must nots, uh, which is quite clear. Um, and then you can relate that to the techniques library, because when you're devolving stuff through uh, throughout an organization, you can't expect everyone to have a familiarity with WCAG, and the language is quite unique within, within that particular community, and it's not necessarily... Um, the friendliest of language. I understand why it's there. It's been de it's been developed, and it's and it's there for a reason. But um, being completely honest, as, as someone with uh, dyslexia, I find work out a cognitive accessibility challenge. <laughs> and I'm part yeah. of the cognitive. Well, you know, I joined you on that as a fellow dyslexic. We we wrote. I think you know, sort of. We, we there's, there's various people that have put them together. Um, you know, on a web standards recently, that's Ian Pouncey, yeah. uh, Penny Swan, who has has now since left the BBC, but she drove you know all the work around the uh, mobile standards. But pretty much, they're they're written so people like me can understand them. Yeah. Uh, and so you know, I'm dyslexic myself. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes I do read standards and I just sat there going, I'm going to get it in a minute. <laughs> I'm going to have to map this out and try and work out what this is trying to tell me what to do. And it's probably very clear, but yeah, it, it, I, I have a small kind of dyslexic meltdowns as far as, as, as comprehension at times. And But again, you know, it, it's one of those, we, we had to write them so anyone particularly a non-accessibility expert could understand them so they, they know what they're supposed to be doing and what the standard and guideline is telling them they can have a look at some code or uh, they could have a look in BBC gel which is our, our design patterns library um, which you can link to so they can see examples of what it is it doesn't say that they have to use those but it gives them you know a good idea of uh, an approach and how to do it and then they have a QA tests and so if you do build something different or do design something different that has to use that standard, you've at least got a test that will tell you whether you've done it correctly or not. And, and so the, the amount of contact that we have to have with, with products is, is, is much reduced on that. You're not dealing with, you know, so we, I think we going back probably quite a while. I mean, I'm sure if I log down the amount of times I answered the same question in a week. You know, <laughs> it would be great. So tell us about alt text, and you're there going, oh, this is, you know, <laughs> it's almost switch it off and on again in your response. It's, it's, you, you wanted to get rid of all that noise, and then once you've removed that noise, 
um, the real issues present themselves that really need a lot of time. So then someone comes up with something and you go, right, I have never seen this before. You've just, you're building something in your product we've never done before. I'm looking at the standards and I'm going, okay, you know, we go, there's a weird edge case in this one. And then you get the accessibility team's time is properly spent in trying to understand and, and, and unpick the problem and helping that team. Um, but this is why we have this Champions Network, you know, 41 people who we're, we're training amongst across the BBC in, in, all in different products, all in different types of jobs. They're not just developers. They're, you know, we've got people in QA, we've got designers, we've got product managers who are becoming accessibility champions. And, and those are the people that are owning accessibility from a discussion point. They're not owning the delivery of it in their product, but they're the people that every ticket that comes up, they're going, how do they build this accessibly? What are the challenges? And, and they're that voice that's in every sprint. And they're the ones that we support. Yeah, I think that's hugely important to, to have, have that enthusiasm, that voice um, in, in every project. Because uh, you, don't, you don't want to be in every project um, meeting or every set of requirements meeting repeating the same stuff time and time. <laughs> I, like I might it. like the sound of my own voice, but <laughs> not that much. <laughs> Gareth. Gareth, I, Gareth I, I have a question about that particular thing because it, it is a very interesting for, you know, such large organizations like BBC embedding accessibility in every single process, every Thing you're doing and I think that this champions that you're doing I, I really do think that's such a great idea so how did it come about and I, I'm always very um, obviously interested in you know more inclusion of employees with disabilities so are you finding that more employees with disabilities are joining the champions or family members or or is it a really good mix of hopefully um, everybody just understanding that when we do accessibility right and we embed it, it improves the experience for all of us. But uh, I was just wondering if you could just dig into that a little bit more. It's quite a new thing. It's quite a new thing. The, the, the Accessibility Champions is really, um, uh, it's, been, it's been run by, uh, set by a guy called Jamie Knight on my team. Um, and it came out actually as a completely random idea when we were, we were looking at the scalability of this and the issues that we were having. A while back, and, and we were talking to another team that are doing a program of work around continuous delivery, and uh, and they they were, were were talking about you know having a champions network, and we went, hang on a minute, that that could kind of work, and we found that other teams also do this thing, so you find there are various champions for various different themes. I was just like, this is just this is nothing real. There's no real rocket science in here, or anything new. So all we did was just went out through the networks internally and just said, look, who's interested? And uh, and let's just find people who just start off with, who just are in a in a position where they just find this fascinating, and it's something as a skill set of skills that they want to build up. So the the training that we do um, around for designers, developers, and, and QA people, and all the rest of it, um, we're moving to sort of a mandate position that everyone should have some base skills in this. But the people that own the conversation is just anyone who has any level of enthusiasm, and it's a real mix. It's a, an absolute mix of people, backgrounds, whatever. People just some, lots of people just seem to care, and uh, <laughs> and, and sometimes you end up with we've had uh, we, I think we've got a couple of problems, you know, where we might end up with with too many champions in one place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but that might that's that's a good problem to have rather than none. You know, it's, but it it's good, uh, and and you know, to me. One of the nice outcomes of this is if we can we can build these skill sets up with 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 you know so everyone on this kind of base level and then champions to become having building up their specialism in it, they leave the BBC and they take that with them, and 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 this is we've seen it up uh, up to now. There are a few people that have left the BBC and we know where they've gone and they've ta they've carried on being the accessibility specialist and it and that kind of influence really kind of I think that kind of hits us more sometimes where we see stuff outside the BBC and we're going that's kind of accessible because of us by you know sort of removed a bit but it's lovely to see that um, and I think you know, more organizations did that you know it, you just end up fixing the web by default I, I, I think that, good I, point there's, there's a, a, a a really important legacy that we have to leave by training people up and and, and, and skilling people 
um, and expect them to go out into the wider world. And, and that's partly why we're, we're, we're training people as well. Um, but I think it's quite clear that, that some of the people that have worked with you in the past have gone on to do fairly amazing things. I saw Kevin Carey yesterday. He was chairing the uh, DCMS meeting for the Accessibility Forum. Um, Pity he hasn't quite got the hang of the simple language yet. We were talking about <laughs> normative equivalents of experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, brilliant guy. No, he is absolutely. I mean, he was really. I mean, he didn't learn, you know, his craft while he was here. He he already knew it, and he turned up. And um, we just brought in Kevin because it was a chance meeting, and he, he was saying some really interesting stuff, particularly around the politics of this and the framing of it. And you know, he knew a lot about tech. Um, and you know, he's an engineer himself. He's run. He he, he understood it from a broadcast point of view I think by that time he'd already had Royal Te Television Society Awards for engineering um, you know so he came in understanding both worlds and as we were kind of putting TV on the web we were like right and there was an opportunity to grab him <laughs> so we went for it uh, and luckily I think we, we had him here for about it was about eight twelve months and um, and then he went on to, to great things um, um, but no, it, it was he was he was a, a huge asset in those early days, and he asked. I mean, to be quite frank, actually, you know, Kevin. So much that he, I, I learned a lot from Kevin, and um, he uh, we had an extraordinary lunch one day, um, which kind of opened up an enormous piece of strategy for us anyway. Um, and uh, it's just a side anecdote, but I was sat there having lunch with him Monday, and I just said, right, Kevin, tell me about television. How do you use your TV? And and for those who don't know, Kevin, Kevin, uh, he's blind. He's blind from birth. And uh, and and Kevin just was. He's very abrupt, isn't he, Neil? You know, he's straight to the point. <laughs> Wonderfully, you know, you get a straight answer from a straight question um, with Kevin. And Kevin said something along the lines of, he said, you know, well, you know, it used to be great. The telly was in the corner. I knew where it was. The button stuck in and out, so I knew what I selected. There was only four channels to choose from. Okay, there was no audio description, which made drama a bit, you know, strange. But pretty much everything else I could get to, I could understand. And then someone designed an EPG and a remote control, and that was it. Game over. You know, I, let alone I have no idea because it's a completely visual interface. I can't even find the the, 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 the buttons, the 40 to 50 buttons. I don't even know where that is. You know, someone's moved it. It's It's, it's gone. You know, I know there's already described content in there, but I'm never going to get to it. And he just gave me this massive rant. And, and then I contacted some guys in, in uh, so I asked Kevin about his access, you know, kit. He was like, I love my phone, which he had a Nokia or something or other, and, uh, and, and the talk screen reader, and, and he had a PC with a Braille display. And he's like, I know where these are. They're in my pocket. They're charging, whatever. And we, we talked about the ergonomics of it. And um, so I contacted a couple of guys in, in R&D. Um, I just said, right, how do we get an EPG onto Kevin's phone <laughs> and bypass everything? How, how does that even work? You know, start and, and that's where that work started on all of the second screen accessibility stuff that we started doing. This was about 2008, 2009, okay. which led all of the stuff that we've done in UView and, you know, and it, it, it just blew out from that one conversation. But I think that's another thing is, is having those kind of people in there that ask questions and point. They're willing to point at the problem. You know, the, 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 it's like the small boy in the Emperor's New Clothes, Kevin. And he's just constantly sitting there going, it's naked. There's <laughs> no one else seeing this. Naked. This question is naked. <laughs> no, he's, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. Right, well. We are reaching the end of our half an hour, which, is, uh, which has been fabulous. I'd like to thank you once again for, um, for sharing your great wisdom. Uh, we hope you'll enjoy it. <laughs> a good dash of sarcasm in there. That's <laughs> <laughs> a great wisdom. <laughs> 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 It's just a good one. It's the, uh, it's the catalyst for many a, a great initiative. So um, thank you once again, Gareth. It's been it's been brilliant. And, thank you, uh, Gareth. And no, thank we'll, you we'll we'll share the link with you shortly. Once we've, uh, I'm going to have fun transcribing this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So I'll be closing now. Okay. <laughs>